send out thy light and thy truth that they may lead me and bring me into thy holy hill and to thy dwelling. Sarah, we're not hearing you, and I wonder if you might be muted. She can't unmute. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises, declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The almighty and merciful Lord 
grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, open thou our lips. And our mouths shall show forth thy praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world and the people with his truth. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Knit my heart to you, that I may fear your name. I will thank you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and glorify your name forevermore. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the nethermost pit. The arrogant rise up against me, O God, and a band of violent men seeks my life. They have not set you before their eyes. But you, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and full of kindness and truth. Turn to me and have mercy upon me. Give your strength to your servant and save the child of your handmaid. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers, and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham, that he would give us, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people, 
for the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Another parable Jesus put before the crowd, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, do you not sow good seed in the field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slave said, the slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them into bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of fatigue. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Blessed are you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For you have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Before the world was made, you chose us to be yours in Christ, that we should be holy and blameless before you. You destine us for adoption as your children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of your will. To the praise of your glorious grace that you have freely given us in the Beloved. In you, we have redemption through the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of your grace, which you have lavished upon us. You have made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of your will. According to your good pleasure, which you set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather together all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Hey, I think that's me and I wasn't uh, minding my cue. Sorry about that. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome to All Saints, uh, in, a, in a very virtual sense, All Saints. Um, I remember growing up and being told that the church is the people and the community of God and the relationships and not the building. And I think in this uh, period of, of COVID, we're uh, seeing that in a very real way. I'm up in Iowa right now um, uh, with Becky and we're just getting some uh, uh, relaxing done up here. Uh, we've done next to nothing, which has really been fantastic. It's just great to have a, a change of pace, a change of venue. I want to tell you that um, it is not unusual for clergy to get a question from their, uh, from their non-churchy friends or maybe even from uh, colleagues or other church people. Uh, when they find out that you're in a new congregation, one of the first things they want to know is, um, so how many members do you have? They're, they're 
uh, part of it, especially when other clergy ask it, it's uh, kind of part of that edifice complex that we have of, of thinking that it's about the building or the size and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's, a, it's a way of trying to get a, 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 a quick snapshot handle on how much responsibility exactly do you have. Um, so people will ask you all the time, people will ask me all the time, uh, meaning well, um, how many members do you have? How big is your congregation? And I always say that that's a hard question to ask. In my previous parish, it was even harder because we were uh, located out in a, a desert um, resort community. And so we had a lot of people, the snowbirds, who would come uh, down for the winter for the, to, get a, to get away from the harsh winter of, uh, of Canada or of the Pacific Northwest. And then they would just be, um, they, they, would, they would come to the desert for that part because it's fabulous in the desert. But because of that, it was never really clear whether they were members of our congregation or if they were members someplace else. Uh, the canons, unfortunately, are written in it from a time when there was one and only one answer to that question, what is your congregation? Um, the, the idea that people might have more than one congregation, the idea that people might worship sometimes with you and sometimes uh, in another denomination altogether uh, was just not anticipated. And so the question of how many members do you have, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. And a lot of people figured out a long time ago, Maybe it's not the right question to answer. For a long time, the church uh, really has uh, favored instead of the how many members do you have metric. The metric is average Sunday attendance. Well, how many people are attending right now? I could a quick glance at the, uh, the Zoom uh, uh, system here. It says that there are 97 participants online right now, but it doesn't count the fact that some people have... Uh, a lot of people sitting with them. I'm just picking a window right here and I can see Greg and Joe Lynn Free and I see that they're, uh, they're sitting together. So of that 97, uh, there's actually two uh, counted as one. Fortunately, Charlotte goes around and counts those so we, we get a better accurate number. But even that one's a tough one because how many people really are participating in our worship? How many people will play this after the fact and play it as a recording? And I guess the more difficult question, how many people are shaped by and part of the witness that we get in our worship together, even if they don't participate right here. In other words, how does our worship and our orienting ourselves towards God shape us and make us ministers of God's presence in ways that we really can't count? The question of how many members do you have is a tricky one. Because you know and I know that there are people in our directory who are listed but have not been inside the church probably for years, maybe in some cases never. We also know that there are people we see all the time who are not listed there. And in addition to things like, you know, uh, clerical errors can happen, there's also just the fact that it's really hard sometimes to figure out who's in and who's out. So, it used to be a lot simpler. I'm not saying it was better, but maybe it was simpler. When today's gospel was written to the, to the early church, the church was being persecuted and the church was also defining for the first time what it means to be the church. What exactly are we? Is Christianity a thing that is different from Judaism? Who do we count as being our members? long before service books and having counts of how many people had actually been baptized, this was really an issue. It was a big problem in the early days of the church to define what is correct believing, what is correct behaving, what is it that sets Christians apart? Jesus tells us that they'll know that we're Christians by our love, but a lot of non-Christians love too, and maybe some of us Christians love imperfectly. It was a time of real confusion and real misunderstanding. And so these words that, that, uh, that Jesus offers in this story of, of uh, the wheat and the weeds or the wheat and the tares, if you've heard that version of it, um, are a compassionate word from Jesus who, who tells the story as if there's people who are in and there's people who are out. In a time when the church was being persecuted, 
even a little bit in Jesus's day, I guess, but this was written well after Jesus's day. Um, the, the story is told that the devil, the deceiver, a villain, the, the forces of evil have come and done this, that is sown weeds into the field so that it was not possible anymore just to say, well, that's my field. Everything that's in there is good and correct. And it messed in the early days of the church. It messed with their sense of who the church is. The church is supposed to be holy, and we say it is one holy Catholic and apostolic church. It's supposed to be holy in the sense of set apart. But uh, my nephew, or my wife's nephew, uh, Steve, was uh, having dinner with us a couple of nights ago and noted that sometimes church people are hard to distinguish from the rest of the community. In fact, uh, he uh, famously said to, uh, to his mother's um, uh, husband, that, uh, you know, the problem I have with going to church, uh, and, and he's saying this to a pastor, I forgot to say that. The problem I have with uh, going to church is that everybody there is such a hypocrite. And to, she, to Steve's chagrin, uh, uh, Terry, the pastor, turned to him and said, well, there's always room for one more, Steve. And I think it goes to that point that you would imagine at first glance that you could easily tell right-thinking church people from people who are not. But the world is so much more complicated than that. And in this time of COVID and being separated from each other, um, some things become a lot clearer. I have to say, at the risk of sounding like I take any pleasure in the, the misfortune that has befallen so many people during this pandemic, that there are things that are good. But I do see God's grace in some of this. For example, I am finding, and maybe you are too, that a lot of my thinking about the church and what's important and what we really need to work hard of, hard on and, and what we are becoming and what the church needs to focus its attention on, that's coming into full view and becoming easier and easier for me to see. And I imagine probably easy for you too. Other things are becoming extremely difficult. A lot of people in this period who set their lives around um, trying to be followers of God with the assumption that if you did all the right things, you would have prosperity, are finding themselves in this horrific position of having lost businesses, having lost financial security, maybe losing their homes, losing access to their friends. There's a lot of loss going on right now, even among God's people. And it's in that context that our first reading this morning from Isaiah comes and delivers an important message. I have to confess that these early readings, the, you know, the first reading uh, on a Sunday morning, I'm not always paying complete attention to that one because I know I'm going to end up preaching on the gospel. But let's take a look at that Isaiah reading again. And before I read it again to you, I want to tell you a little bit of background about the book of Isaiah. It's, it's uh, Isaiah is called a, a major prophet. You know the difference between a major prophet and a minor prophet? It's how long their uh, prophecies go. Uh, Isaiah is probably the, the longest book of the major prophets, but the, the major prophets are the long-winded ones. And Isaiah is one of those, in fact, so long-winded that scholars believe there are actually three Isaiahs, and that, that this text comes from the second Isaiah. Um, they say that because um, Isaiah is speaking, this book is speaking directly to God's people over a period that is far longer than uh, any one human being could possibly live. So in this period, this called the Babylonian exile, when, when all of, the, uh, of God's people were taken out of Israel and, and carried off in bondage to Babylon, uh, this uh, part of Isaiah, shares the voice and the song of God, because this text is actually a song. It says, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Now you notice these words, I am, this is, uh, this is not accidental. This is, this is a, intended to evoke a memory of Jesus telling Moses, tell them I am that I am. I'm the first and I am the last. In other words, there is nothing uh, that came before me. There's nothing that comes after me. There's nothing outside of me. Besides me, God says, there is no God who is like me. Let them then 
proclaim it. Let them declare it and set it forth before me. Who has announced from old, from of old, the things to come? And he says, there is no other rock. I know not one. Now, now I read that at first blush as being one of these types of biblical readings that candidly, I'm not all that crazy about, where it's just like, I am God. I am very powerful. I can squash you like a grape. Um, That's not at all what God is saying here. On the contrary, God is saying to a people who have apparently lost everything, who are are wondering where their help is going to come from, who are wondering how they ought to be organizing their lives so that they could ever have a future. And he is clarifying this and sharpening uh, like a razor the message and saying, your hope is in me and my delight is in you. He's saying there is no other place to look for health and salvation. There is no other place to look for God's steadfast presence, but in the person of God himself. And as surely as that is true, Matthew's gospel is telling us the core message of Jesus, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then back to the gospel again, there's this tricky question of who is you? Now, back in the old days, I'm sure a lot of people remember, um, if, you, if you're a longtime Episcopalian, you know that if you moved from one community to another or to, from one church to another, you were supposed to go in and in writing very formally, uh, do what's called a letter of transfer. It meant that you were supposed to formally write to your priest at your previous church and say, will you please send my baptismal records and And uh, the fact that I'm in good standing in the church and that uh, I'm not running away from the law and all of that, would you please send that to my new priest at this address? And they would literally, we still technically do, we have a a form for it, just that hardly anybody uses it, called a letter of transfer. The the old church sends that letter to to the new church. And you knew by virtue of that who was in and who was out. Everybody, you're either communicating good standing or you're not. You're in or you're out. Things are far more complex these days. We are non-binary. It is certainly the case these days that it is a lot more complex to define a Christian. And it's in that context, I think, that this reading of the, uh, the parable of the, of the wheat and the weeds really makes a whole lot of sense. At a time like this, when we kind of wonder What constitutes the pure faith, the correct faith? Jesus says, no, let it go. Don't try to figure that out. That will be for God to figure out at the end of the age. Steve has a question he's going to share with us uh, later when we go into virtual coffee hour, and it has to do with our notions of race. Again, there was a time when people thought, if you'll forgive the analogy, in very black and white terms, about race. You were one or you were the other. Now we know better. Now we know that our identity is really very fluid and that it's foolhardy to try to answer the question of who is like me. Because the truth is, all of us are like each other. All of us reflect the diversity of the people of God. And that that, this decision of trying to figure out who is and is not a Christian is a fool's errand. Christians are whoever God calls us to be. And at the end, we don't really know whether we are what God was calling to reveal the kingdom of God or not. We just know to put our faith in our God, to relax, to know that we're loved, to go and do our work in the world without concern for the fact that others next to us may not be doing it correctly the way my mother told me. Patrick Wilson writes about it this way when he says, Jesus did not say that the kingdom was like a rock, fixed and solid and firm and unchanging. Although you'll notice, I'm going to interrupt uh, Patrick Wilson here and say, you do notice that in the book of Isaiah, that's precisely what what God says. That's precisely who God is, is that rock, but we are not. So again, Wilson, 
Jesus didn't say that the kingdom was like a rock, fixed and solid and firm and unchanging. Jesus did not say that the kingdom was like a giant machine that you put some things in and some things uh, out and that what you would get depends upon what you put in. He said he was like an enormous tree that grows out of a tiny seed, a tree that grows so enormous that all the birds of the air can come and find shelter in its branches, even strange little ducks like you and me. He said that God was like a housewife who puts a smidgen of yeast in the three measures of flour, and that yield, that yeast yields its life into the whole batch of dough. That is the way that the kingdom of God is, growing from the very beginning into all that God has intended. From the foundation of the world, the very first moment of creation, it is the kingdom that has been on God's mind, and God is definitely patient as it grows. Now, I think that's pretty directly relevant to the times we're living in right now. There's a podcast I was listening to the other day that was trying to figure out why white people are suddenly so interested in racism when the things that have been happening over the last few weeks are no different from what we've seen before. What is it about white people that makes them suddenly interested? Well, there were a lot of theories put forth on this, but I would say that the parable of the weeds here gives us the option of saying, I'm not sure it matters. It might, but I think God calls the right people at the right time to do the right thing. And rather than trying to figure out who's one of us in a world that is desperately trying to say, you're not one of us, you don't belong, whether we're saying it to immigrants, whether we're saying it to each other, In that world, God calls us to see the possibility of the kingdom of heaven being very near in each other. And so it's a pleasure now to um, turn things over to Blythe, who's going to lead us in our nice or in our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ. His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So now is the time in our service when we uh, when we do the offertory, um, and I want to tell you um, another little analogy that I made a long time ago, uh, and just made recently. Um, Pam Bell is making her directorial debut today uh, as our as our director of the worship, and I tell I can tell you from personal experience that this is a hard job, and so we're seeing a couple of things go off the rails and. Uh, you know, that's the way it goes. It's like, uh, as I told her, it's like um, if you're teaching somebody to drive a stick shift, the thing you have to make your peace with right away is you're going to stall out and you're going to pop that clutch many, many times. Um, so, Pam, I think um, uh, we will wait patiently, but what we're looking at, I think it just came.
The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day, we magnify thee. And we worship thy name ever, world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy be upon us. As our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. And now I'm going to pray our collects for today. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, who knowest our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking, have compassion, we beseech thee, upon our infirmities and those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask, mercifully give us for the worthiness of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, you made us in your image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infects our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, good shepherd of the sheep, you gather the lambs in your arms and carry them in your bosom. We commend to your loving care all those who suffer from any illness or disease. Relieve their pain, guard them from all danger, restore to them your gifts of gladness and strength, and raise them up to a life of service to you. Hear us, we pray, for your dear name's sake. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before thee for all members of thy holy church, that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and godly serve thee through our Lord Jesus and Jesus Christ. Amen. It's at this time that we're all invited to unmute ourselves and offer our prayers and petitions and intercessions and thanksgivings uh, for the good of our community, for the good of this church, and for the good of our world. Yeah, if I could jump in real quick and just, just offer a thought. 
Um, one is that uh, everyone should be able to unmute themselves. There was a there was a slide up at the beginning. It was my mistake that that said uh, you could send prayer requests to Lee Reed. Lee is enjoying some vacation time right now, and so uh, you can send those. Um, uh, all of a sudden, I forgot who was doing it. You can send them to Nancy Critchlow, um, or you can just uh, call them out yourself. Yeah, this is Charles. I want to continue to pray for um, the finding a cure for the coronavirus and for all those who are sick from it and those who have died and their families. And I also like to pray for the racial reconciliation. And, you know, I'd like to pray for the protesters, particularly those in um, Portland, Oregon right now. And I also like to give Thanksgiving for this church and for family. And once again, for all the beautiful things of nature, things like the lizards and the um, and the cactus flowers and and all those um, wonderful things. I just got word too that um, apparently people are not necessarily able to send public texts right now. Um, we'll get that fixed for next time. But um, uh, in the meantime, I would suggest if you have a uh, if you have a prayer request and you're not able to send it to Nancy. Um, give, give that a try, but if you can't do it, please just come right on and uh, let's hear your prayer. And thank you, Charles. I'd like to say a prayer for hope and healing for Sarah and Wayne and Holly. I'd like to offer thanksgiving for the life and work of john lewis Amen. i'd like to pray for our school teachers and our school administrators and our bus drivers and our custodians and all of the people who are going to be facing the challenge of uh, trying to go to school this fall I'd like to pray for everybody who's just had it with this pandemic that people uh, people don't be brought down by discouragement and hopelessness I'd like to offer Thanksgiving for the life of Bill Hilgers who died this week uh, he was an Austin lawyer uh, and had been at Westminster for a number of years but a leader in uh, many, many ways in the Austin community. Go ahead, say what you prayer. I pray for Thomas Finger to get better. I pray for my cousin Mark who died of COVID on his 59th birthday. May peace be with him and his family. Pray for all the school teachers and administrators trying to figure out a safe way to uh, have education for the kids this fall. I pray for all those folks who are alone and dying or sick and they're not able to have their, their loved ones with them. May God's uh, balm of peace be upon them. Amen. I want to pray for Becky's nephew, Steve, the one who uh, doesn't go to church because of all the hypocrites. Um, Steve uh, <laughs> and, and Lisa were recently married, and uh, I can see that this is a good match, and I offer prayer for them both. I also pray for yeah. Randy and, and, and Josephine Scherfe and, and the whole his Scherfe. wife, Becky's nephew, Steve, okay. the guy who doesn't go to church. Keep going, Steve. Yeah, I was just praying for Randy, uh, Josephine Scherfe's son, uh, who is one of those folks in a place where they can't be with him. And, and, and so Robbie and, and 
uh, Joe Sherfee and Josephine, uh, may, may God be comforting and blessing them. I want to give thanksgiving to God for bringing the next owner to our home who we went under contract with yesterday. Uh, Maureen's hands and God's hands are all over it. Uh, God bless heaven. Did you did you dig up Joseph yet? <laughs> Not till after closing. <laughs> Good wise words. I want to ask for prayers for my um, beloved nephew who keeps struggling with mental illness, and for my sister who is so heartbroken by his struggles. We pray we, also. Go ahead. No, Nancy, are you going to? Yes. Thank you. We pray also for our Supreme Court and especially for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is battling cancer again. We pray for healing for Jill, Lou, Shannon, and Richard. We pray for Glenda and all who are discouraged and depressed. We pray for Trish Conrad and the memory of Buck Wood. We pray for Steve, Carla, Dick, and Danny, who is serving in Afghanistan. And for Leslie Ann, who prepares today for surgery tomorrow. We pray for Josh, who is looking for work and for all those in similar situations. We pray for Pam, for Ananias, for Judy and Rebecca. We pray for Holly, who has been raising her grandchildren for the past three years on her own and is experiencing a lot of fear and anxiety during the pandemic. Mm. We pray for KK, for Pierce, for Hawk, for Eliza, for Rick, Ann, Carmen, and Carl. We pray for Susan and her family who have COVID-19 in their household. We pray for Nell, who is living in Portland. We pray for the women of Lockhart and Lane Murray and all who are currently incarcerated. <clears throat> we pray for all who have lost work, health insurance, or are under financial duress due to COVID. For Bill Connor, who is separated from his family. For Wade, whose cancer has returned with a vengeance. For the continued health of John's son and other members of the family, and in thanksgiving for the recovery of the Brock family from COVID. We pray for healing for Tressie. We pray for peace for Jay who died this week and comfort for his wife, Cindy. We pray for the Dowell family. We offer thanksgiving for Bobby and Mary Wright's grandson who was released from uh, neonatal ICU and is home. And we um, hope that uh, his sister will be home to join him soon. And I believe those are all of our prayers from the chat this morning. And, and we, we and we pray, dear Lord, that you would uh, hear these, these prayers um, and that through them you would work your mysterious will and that you would keep our hearts open and humble uh, to feel your compassion for those all around us who are going through a very, very hard time right now. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And now let us say together, uh, if the slide comes up, the general thanksgiving. I will say it on, on our behalf. Almighty God, Father of all mercy, we thine unworthy servants do give thee most humble and hearty thanks 
for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy, Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Love your enemy. of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
So let's um, let's see if there's any announcements uh, for for the good of our community, and then we'll celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. But first, does anybody have something that we need to know? Lane? I don't think I've got any. Um, you know, just Steve getting married and that's it. Oh, you mean just regular announcements? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, um, didn't have any uh, off the top of my head, although it, it occurs to me, um, as you know, we've, uh, we've had to put together a plan for our return to imperfect, to imperfect, to in-person worship. And the goal is not to start that quickly. The goal is to have a plan approved quickly so we can say we know what our plan is. Our plan has been approved. I'm delighted to report that because now we can start focusing on, all right, now how are we going to actually make it happen? And I can tell you that um, as of the last time we spoke, because the pandemic really is acute right now in the Austin area, um, we, will, uh, we will not be returning to imperfect imperfect to in-person worship. We'll stay with the imperfect worship, um, but our in-person worship will not be uh, coming back in the near term, uh, but we are all very much looking forward to that day that it is safe to do that. And I want to thank the many people who put that together um, and made it happen. I also, while I have the floor, just again want to say a word of thanks to Pam. This is a hard job. Trust me. Everything that you do that is right, nobody sees it. And everything you do that is wrong, everybody sees it. Um, and I, I really appreciate um, Pam's willingness to step into this. And trust me, Pam, it only gets easier. Great. Anybody else? Well, then how about birthdays and anniversaries? Steve, Steve, who who Steve. can we celebrate? Yeah. Steve? Mark? No, it's Don. Oh, uh, just a quick just a quick announcement. In uh, two weeks, on August second, we will be celebrating our graduating acolytes and our graduating seniors, high school and college, uh, this year. And we will be having two of our seniors preaching. So make sure everybody is here to celebrate that wonderful service. That is going to be a fun morning, August 2nd. Don't miss it. I'd like to make a quick announcement, please. Mm -hmm. um, many of you, I think, remember when the Haitian Boys Choir came uh, to Austin uh, right after the earthquake in Haiti and toured um, some of the churches, including our own. Some of us were host families to those boys. And I've been keeping up with them ever since um, and um, modestly donating to the uh, Trinity Music School, Holy Trinity Music School. Um, they are really, really having a tough time right now. I know many, many organizations and institutions are, um, uh, but they're struggling to pay salaries for their teachers. And um, I just want to offer, uh, this is Sarah Vela speaking, if you don't see me, um, but I want to offer uh, that I have contact information for how and, and, and whom to pay in order to contribute. And um, if you want to reach out to me, um, if you are at all moved to support the Holy Trinity Music School in Haiti, uh, I have that contact information and that payment information. Thanks, Sarah. Hey, Steve, I have a, a question for Dawn. Can you hear me? Yep. Don, how many graduates do we have total? Uh, we have seven. Seven high school? Seven high school. And are we doing baskets? We are not doing baskets, uh, but we are doing some of the other traditionals that we've done in the past. The monkeys and so forth. One of the great things that we do, the prayer monkeys. 
Anybody else? I don't have first experience or first hand experience uh, with these monkeys, but I hear they're fantastic. Yeah, they're the best. Who's celebrating a birthday? Or an Lane, Lane, the best part of the monkeys is we used to process them up to the altar and you say a prayer over them. When, uh, when that is possible, I will be delighted to do it. Okay. Go ahead. My birthday's tomorrow. So fine. And and thank you to everyone who addressed the email I sent out. It's greatly appreciated. Beautiful. Anybody else? My birthday is Thursday. Blythe. Blythe, that's exciting. And Blythe, it was so much, it was so fine to have you with us this morning. Thank you. You read well. Yeah, it was under to the point of Tuvia, Blythe, who else? Okay. Well, then let's pray uh, and celebrate, especially Tuvia and Blythe. Uh, oh, God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace and believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.